All right, guys, uh, welcome to this platform. This is where we're going to be having um, conversations about what's going on around the country. Just catching up. Uh, it's been a while. It's now just like, that's what, one day since, one day and four months since the elections happened on 9th of August. Um, it's been a quiet time for those of us who didn't make it back to parliament. Uh, for me, I have been Haparuare Central Hotel. I'm sure you've been seeing it on our platforms. Tunauza uh, Chai Namandazi, Tunauza Kanyama Choma Kidogo. And we are just watching the country um, and playing our role in just making sure the country is moving forward. And when you are in Nyeri, please make sure you pass by. Uh, we have some good food. And scare prizes ni hustler friendly. So, karibu ni sana. Um, so, four months. And what, 90 days? Approximately 90 days. I think it's going to be 90 days around this week. Uh, since government got into office. Um, and some of the things that have been interesting that I have noticed. First, let's give it to President Ruto on this one. We've had a lot of people who've given promises, political promises over the years since independence. And um, I pointed out a couple of weeks ago that the one thing he has done right, he has actually done a very good job of fulfilling the promises he gave. You saw we, we remember making fun of Wetangula and Mudavadi uh, when they joined Kenya Kwanza during the campaigns and people were making fun and saying, oh, you know, hallelujah, uh, nini, nini, but here they are. Um, Musalia is a chief prime minister, I mean, chief cabinet minister. Betangula is a speaker. Uh, and they actually, you, you can see the consolidation in Western, it's happening in a way that it's never been, it's never been seen before. And uh, my good friend Atoli, who is now uh, supporting the president, despite uh, all the moments of shenzi, shenzi, shenzi during the campaigns, made a very interesting comment a few days ago when he said, we led to Lin Yoroshua. And, and even for me as uh, what was the de facto leader of Kieleweke uh, in the last term, I can actually admit we did everything we could to stop uh, William Ruto from being president. And he was able to run over us. And for that, you have to give it to him. We had government, we had the president, we had everything you hear, the deep state system, all those things. And we did quite a bit of work. Of course, we are going to keep pointing fingers at each other where people drop the ball. Um, and that, I'm sure a book will be written about what happened in that election. And because it was a very strange election in how it went. But give it to William Ruto. He played a very good game. And the results are here to be seen. The fact that he is now the fifth president of the Republic of Kenya tells you, yeah, and as I told totally said, I think it's important for all of, all of us who are running against him to first accept that he won that election. You can claim, you can point fingers, we can argue about the technicalities and the dynamics of what happened where, but ultimately an election is done. And when it's done, you have a winner or a loser. And on this one, William Ruto took the prize. So you have to give it to him. Uh, the 30 days, the 90 days that he's been in office, we've seen some interesting things. Um, I think first is how he has tried to set up his government. I remember there were claims, uh, those of us, especially from Central Kenya, who were sure that there had been no negotiation between Central Kenya and, him, and, the, and, the, and the president. We still, get, we still find ourselves calling him deputy president. And the president now. The, uh, recently I saw the deputy president, Rigadi Gashagwa, saying that he has um, over provided to the region beyond what people had expected. And he has done a good job. When you look at his cabinet, uh, when you look at his um, the permanent secretaries, uh, principal secretaries, you can't argue the fact that as much as he's been fought in other regions, Central Kenya, you can't fight him. You can't fight uh, Ruto in Central Kenya, uh, in Mount Kenya region, because he has actually delivered beyond what people expected he was going to do in terms of the representation of the people of our region in his government. Um, and for that, I have to give it to him. As I said, I have to give it to him for delivering on his promises in terms of the promises he made to various people, whether it's like in Adwale uh, to join cabinet. Um, you see his cabinet. You see he promised uh, Wetangula. He promised Mudavadi. He promised various regions to representation. People like um, Amazon Kingi um, and what he is now in government. You know, you, you see Alfred Mutua. Um, 
I mean, a member of cabinet. So you, you see a man who is trying, and if he can actually stay like that, if he can stay the course, he's going to be a very interesting president to watch. And as Twali said, 2027 is going to be a difficult one for somebody trying to run against him if he stays the course. If he continues delivering and being known as a man who, when he promises you something, is actually going to deliver. He's going to be an interesting man to watch over the coming years. And this is a different presidency in that you get that vibe of a guy who says something and intends to deliver it. You see the amount of, I mean, 90 days is a long time. It's a short time, it's still a long time. If he was going to let the ball drop, it would have dropped by now. You get the, the, the work ethic, the, the hours we hear he puts in, the amount of time we put in, the amount of detail. There's this memo he sent to, to parliament the other day with his suggestions of what the kind of laws he's looking for. You don't remember things like that happening. In, in, in the past with past presidents, where somebody is actually actively engaged in how various arms of government are, are running. We have three arms of government. We have seen how the executive is running, and we've seen the kind of discipline he's trying to bring into that. We see him engaging with the judiciary to the point where he's been accused of looking like he's trying to own the judiciary. Now we see him engaging with, with parliament, and, and they're just proposing laws and trying to mobilize his troops to pass laws on gender, quality, this whole idea of creating an office for the opposition leader is a very interesting um, idea because it looks like a mollify, like he's trying to mollify Raila on this one, telling him, boss, I'll take care of you. I'm not going to bring you to government like Uhuru did, but I'm going to give you something. And, and this one is going to be structured in government. You're going to have, uh, you're going to have the power of an office. You can mobilize your troops. It's, it's a way of, of, of taking care of Raila and keeping him away from um, just being controversial because sometimes some of some people have argued that when you see Raila going to the streets is because it has nowhere else to go so maybe what uh, Ruto is trying to do is give him somewhere to go so that he can actually have a platform from which he pushes his agenda and an, of, an office of the opposition which is why we were, some of us were supporting BBI having an official office of the opposition leader means even if you don't make it to the presidency there's somewhere else you're going so you don't get lost the, the winner take it all uh, argument that we had before where that when you lose, you lose. You have a guy who got close to 7 million people supporting him. And the guy who won had just slightly above 7 million people. So it's nearly, it was nearly a tie. So when one becomes president, what happens to the other guy? There have been arguments that in first world, you can lose with a small margin and just disappear. But that's not here. We have people whose aspirations were stuck with Raila. And they're the people who, if you don't give him somewhere to be, people who keep refusing to accept this government. But when he accepts to be the official opposition leader, then his supporters have to accept that there is a leader. So this is a, this is a uh, pretty brilliant strategy by the President uh, William Ruto on how to manage the opposition. And I think it's going to be good for us. We also need to realize that it's not always going to be Raila and Ruto. In years down the road, it's going to be other people. If you have a situation where one person can be president and then the, second, the first runners-up can be opposition leader, our country is moving forward. We have had some interesting proposals made by this government. I think one of the ones I, that has brought up the most controversy is the Hustler Fund. Um, personally, any money being given by government to help people, however it comes, needs to be accepted. And I think I'm a bit uh, disappointed um, in my former colleagues who are pushing people to take money and not pay. Uh, that money doesn't belong to anybody, it belongs to us as Kenyans. The fact that you've taken 500 shillings from a hustler fund, you haven't taken Ruto's money. That money is part of our taxes. So when I, somebody tells you take it and don't pay, he's actually saying take our taxes and don't, hold it, don't be held accountable for it. I think what I wish I could see a lot more from this government is people trying to push the agenda of, trying to explain how that hustler fund works. I had suggested, and I'm going to suggest again, that maybe this particular government needs to set up a department to communicate. For example, if you are raising, if we, we are seeing people who have succeeded or become relatively comfortable financially by starting a business with 500 shillings or 1,000 shillings or 2,000 shillings, if we had consistent interviews, and I know the government can be able to identify people like those, legitimate, ordinary Kenyans, men and women, who started an egg business or selling handkerchiefs or selling milk or something, with a thousand shillings and are now comfortably taking care of their children, running their own lives. If we were able to see those kind of businesses on a regular basis, people would stop looking down on this hustler fund. Because people are saying, what do you do with 500 shillings? There's a time when 500 shillings can mean the difference between literally whether you're gonna have a meal or not. 
if you take that 500 and put it in somewhere where you're going to make 100 or 50 shillings and eat that 50 shillings and tomorrow you make another 50, we're moving forward. So I support the Hustler Fund purely on the fact that it's a concept of empowering people at the very, very bottom of the pyramid to get to access some money and have ideas. What we need to provide a lot more of are ideas of what you can do with 500 shillings, what you can do with 1,000 shillings, what you can do with 2,000 shillings. And I think this is the responsibility of the government because they're the ones who have introduced a fund with such minuscule amounts of money being disbursed to also suggest what you can do with that money. Otherwise, we are going to have a situation where the Hustler Fund is going to be a consumable fund. People will take it, eat that money, and hope something will change in 14 days so that they can pay. And we're going to have a lot of uh, non-payments, which I don't think is where this idea was coming from. I also think it's important to accept that Kenya is now going to be a completely political country all the time. I hear people saying, I was one of the people in the last term who was arguing that we need to have a place where politics stops so that we can work. But I think what we have seen, Mapema and your best. So, sir, I mean, if there's anything we have learned from William Ruto, is that you don't wait. You start preparing yourself as quickly as you can. I know I have seen Kalonzo preparing himself. I think what we are seeing with uh, Raila, as much as people might claim he's old, he's also him preparing himself for the next election. And let's be honest, even what William Ruto is doing is the same. When you see him spending a lot of time in Western, where he didn't get votes, we didn't get a lot of votes. He's preparing himself. He wants to make sure that by the next time, he's in a, he's in a much more comfortable place. Um, you see Alfred Mutua being given a role in this government. Why is he being given a role in this government? It's because William Ruto needs to find a way to enter into Eastern. Um, you see him going into the coast. So despite the fact that William is just working for the government, he's also preparing himself for the next election, which is, uh, what, four four and a half years away uh, from where we are. So this is what is happening. I think I want to finish this particular uh, conversation with uh, local politics, regional politics. Um, my good friend, the Deputy President, Rigadi uh, Gashagwa, who is an amazing guy. I do not know whether there's anywhere else in the country where a man has jumped from being a first time member of parliament to being the second most powerful person in the executive. I don't know. Maybe there is, but I, not to my immediate memory. Um, and I think that has both pros and cons. I think the negatives of that is, Rigadi didn't get an opportunity to create his own networks in government. Usually when you look at somebody like the, the current president, he had been in politics, elective politics, for close to over 20 years. In those 20 years, you had the capacity to create networks within the executive. You have allies across the country, so that when you're a deputy president, you actually you have your own personal relationships. Because I think the office of the deputy president is driven more by personal, personal relationships rather than by actual support of the office. It is you have a strong office, yes, but getting things done is based a lot more on your own personal relationships with people. And that is one of the things I'm not sure that the current deputy president has been able to develop over the years that he's been in. Of course, having been a former administrator, he has people in the administration. But in terms of politics, um, you can see that small shake-up, that small gap of his the alliances and the strengths that he has as an individual politically in terms of the alliances he has. We also remember that there was a bit of a push and pull when he was actually being identified as a deputy president. So it's going to be interesting to watch how he does uh, the next four years and how he uses this office that he's been able to, he's literally jumped into an office from very far. I, my best wishes are with him, um, of course, from a selfish perspective. Uh, coming from Nyeri, it would be very powerful for him to do well. And I think who, I am one of the people who's made a commitment to do everything I can to help him, to put my mind in whatever capacities I have to help him succeed. Because if he succeeds, it's good for us as Nyeri, it's good for us as a region, it's good for us as a country. Um, and I think the, the primary thing, we've had a conversation about whether he's a regional kingpin or not. I think first and foremost, let's accept that he's a senior most politician from our region. As deputy president, we don't have any other person, whether it's Meru, Embu, Kikuyu, in the government who is more senior to him in active politics. So he's a senior most politician. Does that make him a regional kingpin? I think that is time that will tell. Regional kingpin is acceptability in terms of how do other people view you? Have you been accepted by the social political leadership of the region? Have you been accepted by the other politicians? in the region, have people accepted to be led by you? 
This is going to depend a lot on how he works over the next couple of years. How he, is he able to mobilize people around causes and interests that are important to the region? Uh, do people accept that he represents the interests of the region? Are we going to accept that he's a face of the politics of our region? This is where he's going to require a lot of strategic thinking. He's going to require a lot of patience. He's going to require a lot of humility uh, because he's going to meet people who are just refusing from our region to accept him. And he's going to have to bring everybody on board until we get to the point where, like Uhuru had been, that when he says this is where we're going, this is where we're going. He also needs to start getting people around him who are willing to stand up, not just say he's a regional kingpin, but also represent him and then build him up and strengthen him to be a regional kingpin. But three months, he's just had three months. He's done very well. Uh, the decision to support Kaninikega to Yala was a masterstroke as far as I'm concerned because all of us know that Kaninikega and Rigadi don't get along. That he was able to put aside his own personal interests and support Kanini for that seat, put him ahead as far as people like myself are concerned. It showed that at a certain point he's able to put aside his own personal interests and do what he thinks is right for the, for the, for the region. If he can stay on that course, I think Rigadi has a very high possibility of being a regional kingpin. But I said it's a process, it's going to take time. Thank you very much. See you again soon. Let's have this conversation. Asante.